So let's go to Philemon chapter, or well, there's no chapter really, it's just verses 3 through 7. And let's dig into Christ in me. Uh, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and toward all saints that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> you can be seated. This, um, Just to give you a little bit of a background on this passage of Scripture, this, this uh, book of the Bible... Um, Philemon was a, uh, was a believer, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, was writing to Philemon um, in, in an effort to appeal to him um, for, on the behalf of a man by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus had uh, previously, he, Onesimus was a servant, a slave, that was owned by Philemon. And prior to this, um, he had escaped his, uh, his enslavement. And after he had escaped and left uh, Philemon's um, uh, control, essentially, um, I, I believe, uh, well, I know for sure that Onesimus became a, a believer later. I'm not sure about the, the, the conversion place of Philemon. Um, but... Paul, and, and had become a helper of Paul, and had become a, an important uh, part of his ministry. And uh, Paul, in an effort to, uh, in, in an effort to do, do right by both Onesimus and Philemon, uh, was appealing to Philemon, and uh, basically asking for him to willingly uh, free and release his ownership of uh, Onesimus. Um, and, uh, and he appeals to him on, uh, on the grounds of, of, of Christian virtues. And he, uh, now what we know of Philemon, um, and I know that this kind of rattles our brains, but um, b- because of where we are in life and where we are in history, um, so it's hard for us to, to grasp that a slave owner would be uh, a, a spirit-filled Christian. But, this was the case. This was the culture that they were a part of and, and were co- in the process of coming out of. And so um, what Paul begins to do is he, he appeals to Philemon. And, and what we know of Philemon is that he was, a, he was a, 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 an important part of the, the church. And so was Onesimus. And that what we know also about from what we learn from the Word of God a lot through Paul is he writes in other places, he says, there is no Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or female, in the kingdom of God. We are all equal in the eyes of the Lord. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that our station in life is equal, because we're all born to different circumstances. But in the eyes of Christ, and in the kingdom of God, we are on equal ground. And so he begins to appeal to him, and I'm not going to deal with that specifically, but I do want to share with you that his faith, talking about Philemon's, had already been active. He had already demonstrated his faith in God and his willingness to live for the Lord and according to the ways of God. And Paul now wants him, the faith that he's already demonstrated to become effective in relation to Onesimus. In other words, he wants him to put his faith into action, into practice. And he says specifically that the communication of of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you. He's acknowledging there are good things in you that have been placed there by God. Jesus Christ has done a work in you, and now it's time for that work in you to come out and become tangible. 
And what we learned on Sunday, what we were preached about was uh, where Brother Sersted took, uh, kind of uh, honed in on this last part. We're talking about the good things that are in us through Christ, the working of Christ. And he addressed the reality that so often we as believers in God have a great capacity for believing that God is in you and working in you. And we have a great capacity and a great faith to believe that God will put good things in you. But when it comes to ourselves, we sometimes struggle to have faith and belief and confidence that there really are good things from God in us. That there are spiritual workings from God in us. But that really is truly the truth. Paul points out there are many good things in Philemon, in Christ. And because of Philemon's blessings, he has a great opportunity to, to uh, he has great opportunities that are provided to him by God. Amen. And so I pose the question, my first question for our audience participation is, why is it so hard for us to believe that Christ will work effectively in us? Now don't get too shy. I know based upon the response in the altar on Sunday that many of us agreed. Yeah, you're right. Brother Sirstead, sometimes it is hard for me to believe that Christ is in me and working. Amen? And we receive faith. But why is that? Sister Lucy. Because we know our flesh. We're well acquainted with our flesh. We know our frailties. Yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else want to share? They're waiting. Oh, for the Boyd. Upbringing. Um, we were told maybe from our parents that you're nothing, you're no good, you're, you know, and society has told that to a lot of us uh, through just life and growing up. And so I think that when we come, we know we, we can have faith for other people because, oh, we just, you know, I'm praying for you, but to really believe it for ourselves, it's, I believe that's why it is hard for some of us because of the way we were probably brought up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, our environment. I think that's good. You know, one of the, one of the tools of the enemy, of the, one of the tools of the devil is he likes to separate and he likes to convince us that we are alone that we are unique. One of the one of the big uh, one one of the big tactics of the devil is to get us to believe that that no one else has experienced what we have experienced. That's why it's so powerful and important to share our testimonies so that people will know that they that 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 wow your testimony is similar to mine because the enemy wants us to think nobody has ever faced anything like this before nobody has ever uh, dealt with this kind of temptation nobody's ever dealt with the the scars that you have all those people in the church they they were all half sanctified before they got there <laughs> but you <laughs> it's going to take a little extra dose of the holy ghost to get something from god the devil wants us to believe that. Right? So we have the flesh. We, we know our faults. We're sometimes our own worst enemies. We have our upbringing. That our culture tells us that we're negative. We have, we have the enemy trying to separate us. Brother Humphrey? One of the other things is intimidation. Hmm. We see... Uh, God working through other people, you know, which was spoke on about Sunday, but uh, not us because we don't think that we're worthy. So we're intimidated by seeing God work through other people instead of rejoicing and embracing and growing from it. I think that's a, a really good, uh, a really good point. Absolutely. We need to get past the, the mentality that, uh, 
that, that it's a zero-sum game, that if, so, if God blesses somebody else, then he's not going to bless us. That if God uses somebody else, that he's not going to bless us. He's not, or he's not going to use us. God can do it all. Amen? He can do it all. And he can use us, and he can use somebody else. And I like that, where he said, we, we, instead of rejoicing with someone else being used of God and having it spark faith that, wow, if God can use them, then he can use me too. Amen? We sometimes, we get intimidated. Amen? These are all things that the enemy likes to try to send our way so that we stop believing Christ is in us and effectual and wants to work in us. Amen. But we were encouraged on Sunday, we were encouraged that no, Christ is in us. He puts His Spirit in you. Uh, we, we learned that there are gifts of the Spirit that are uh, given to the church, but they, are, uh, uh, the, but they are operated by individuals within that church. God really does want to use us. As a matter of fact, He specifically chooses to work through people to do His work in this world. Brother Collins? For me, for me a lot of times it's self-doubt. Even when God is using me like He has, you know, it's like, I, part of the reason, if you've ever wondered why a lot of times you see me tarrying when when God is using me, is because I'm working on the flesh, getting, getting the flesh out of the way, but it's also getting the self-doubt out of the way for, for me, for my walk and what I do. You're specifically talking about when God uses you in tongues and interpretation. Yeah, especially, but he's used me in other ways too. Sure. And, I, and it's something personally that I struggle with quite a bit. I wonder if anyone has an experience that they might share where they've been faced with this type of doubt, but then they've overcome it. Brother Josh. So back when um, I came back from training, I went through a huge trial that I shared with the church um, when I got back. Uh, something that I have struggled with in my past was, uh, was forgetting my own testimony. Um, in my past, God has delivered me from my big, the big evil that I've dealt with through my life, which was uh, a heart filled with hate and anger. And that was that the day I got rid of that was the day that I got baptized. It was yes. that very morning. And, you know, it's a huge problem that we forget the mountains that we overcame when we're in the desert. It's, it's, and... Uh, I was in a desert when I got back. I was thirsty. I was starving spiritually, emotionally, all of the above. And once I got back, once I got that breakthrough, it was a huge reminder of, oh, wait, this is not the first mountain that I overcame. Right. This, this is not the first de Amen. desert that I went through. And that's something that, you know, I forgot about. Yeah, it's good. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we have, to, we, we have to remember who God is, what He's done in our life. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have to remind ourselves what the Word says because we have to live by faith. Praise God. And we, uh, one of the things that we need to remind ourselves is found in Philippians chapter 4. Verse 10, and it says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care uh, for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now that I speak in regard to need, or not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And here's the, 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 the main focus of what I want to uh, bring to you. In verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Praise the Lord. 
I can do all things through Christ. One of the things that was shared with us is that we have a great faith in God as believers. We believe God can do anything. But we forget that He is in us and He uses our, per- he uses our person, our talents that He put there, our uniqueness, Sometimes even our quirkiness. <laughs> He'll even use our stubbornness. <laughs> he uses us. It's not just God doing the work, but He uses us. He doesn't want to do it without you. And we each have something unique to bring to the kingdom of God, and we need to avail ourselves to Him in order for that uniqueness to be there. However, we sometimes forget that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now there's a whole lot here that Paul is talking about. Uh, in this passage, he's, he's actually thanking the Philippians for a financial blessing that they had sent him. They had sent him an offering, But he's also expressing faith in God for whatever situation he finds himself in. He's saying, thank you for the the offering. I I appreciate that you remembered uh, to, to, to bless me. However, it's not just because of the need. In other words, and, and he goes on to explain, he's, I'm not just talking about the need because I have found that even if you had not blessed me, even if you were not able to uh, help me out financially, I have found that whatever state I am in to be content. When I'm, when I, when I'm full, I'm content. When I'm, when I'm empty, I'm content. And the reason that Paul can say that is because of that last little bit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When I'm weak and I'm empty and I'm in a destitute situation, I can still do all things through Christ because it isn't me. I'm not looking at my flesh and just looking and saying, well, I can't do it. Well, I'm incapable. I've done this wrong. I've done that wrong. I've got this huge list of uh, faults. He's looking at Christ and saying, I can do all things through Him because He has made me able. Amen. And so we have to remind ourselves that because, as Brother Josh pointed out, we forget. We get mired down in the circumstances and in whatever we're going through, the daily life just, I mean, some of us got mired down in the traffic on the way in. (laughs) I heard it was bad. Brother Wally was telling me that, that it was rough. And, and I know coming, I know, you know, brother and sister Boyd, you come from uh, all, the, all the way from to, in, down that JBLM corridor. That's horrible. I've been on that. I try to avoid that like the plague. <laughs> That's just one example. But we get mired down by things and we have to remind ourselves, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so his confidence, Paul's confidence, is great and, he makes, and it makes him able to be ready for any situation because his confidence is in God. But, because, but his confidence is not just in God. He realizes God is in me and He is using me. Amen. Look, true repentance, true, true repentance to God coming to grips with our sin, it doesn't require that we believe that we are worthless and all bad. It requires that we recognize that we are unworthy of grace, or I guess we should say, as Brother Sirstead would say, we are worthy of grace, (laughs) but we don't deserve grace. Amen. That we are a sinner that we have done wrong, but we should not believe the lie of the enemy that we are all bad and can do nothing. 
we really can do something because if we couldn't, God wouldn't bother using us. Why would he waste why would he waste a space to place his Holy Spirit in if you were worthless and unable to do anything? Why would he do that? Well, he doesn't. Because we are enabled and empowered to live for God, to walk in, in, in his kingdom, to contribute to his kingdom. And so I want to ask this question. What do you think Paul means that he knows how to be abased and to abound? What do you think Paul means by that? If you need to take a minute to reread that scripture, go ahead. Get the context. Brother Delph. Speak of the mic, brother. Okay. I think part of it may have been when he was on the road to Damascus and he got blinded and he had to be hand carried and directed until he received his sight back from the Lord. You know, that's kind of a base pretty good pretty good. That's a pretty low point in life. Yeah. And then the high point is he was bit. I don't know, was this before or after the Isle of the Patmos? I don't know. <laughs> Because if it was after, then he had been bitten and nothing happened to him. You know? mm. So he had all kinds of things in his life that would go to the highs. Oh, yeah. There were all some amazing things that happened in Paul's life, some amazing miracles. So he had some high points, to your point. And he had some low points. Absolutely. Being beaten by, by the jailers at Philippi. He, in, a, in a very short period of time, he experienced uh, highs and lows. He casts out a devil. He's beaten and put in jail. And then before the night's over, he's preaching to a household of people and baptizing them all. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Paul's life, yeah, is up and down, experience after experience preaching to people and they're receiving his word and then being chased out of town, you know. I mean, my goodness. But in all of that, his confidence wasn't just in, him, in himself, but it was that God is going to continue to use me. Amen. Paul uh, confessed at one point, he confessed to having, um, having, being very well aware and almost a, a little bit of, a, a, of ashamed of his past as a persecutor of, of the Christians. He says, of, of sinners, I am chief. But he didn't let that disqualify him from the calling of God. Even though others questioned it, it took a long time for the, even the disciples to, uh, the, and, and the original apostles to, to warm up to the fact that <laughs> we're not sure if we believe if you're really converted. We all, we, all be, we, we all know what God did in us, but we're not so sure about you. <laughs> we know what you did before, right? Yeah. We've talked about here about how our own, knowing our own flesh, our past and, and the world sometimes condemning us. We need to make sure that we as the church don't contribute to that doubt in people. Amen? Praise the Lord. Because sometimes, sometimes we are the ones that are saying, we know what you did before. <laughs> Amen. Brother Collins, you had something to share? Yeah, I was just thinking, if you read that carefully at the start, it's saying that it's talking about how they, were take, they wanted to take care of him, but they weren't able to right away. And on a simpler note, I think it's also saying that he knew how to do without, just plain do without and do with. I had a friend one time that loved standing rib roast, but if he had to eat top ramen, he would just as happy to eat top ramen as long as he had something in his stomach, you know. <laughs> and, and, and at a different level, I think that's what it's saying there. They, had, they wanted to help and they weren't able to, so he had to do without while that was working through. Mm -hmm. And he knew how to work through those low times when, 
when he didn't have the things that maybe were necessary, even, even at a lower level than, you know, we're talking about, about being bid and all the things. I think even at a, at a simpler level, it's talking about knowing how to do without and still be content. And that's something that's hard for all of us to do. Amen. I think that leads to our next question. What is it about God that makes Paul able to be content in every situation? Joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. So he knew what had the joy of the Lord. Yes. Amen. All right. Thank you. Sister Defoe also had something she wanted to share. When I came out to be with my daughter, the birth of my granddaughter, of course, those of us that have have gone through that type of experience, we know that an entire household gets upended when a, a new child arrives back into it. And especially in a home where there's never been one, a first child comes in and you're not used to being up two thirds of the night and down and up and you don't know which end works and which end doesn't, and sometimes they both do. I, I got to stay there with Janelle and David, and I basically had baby duty for two weeks. And one of David's friends um, from the world, very worldly, we had a discussion. I was sitting there on the couch. My hair probably was standing on end in a bathrobe, rocking a fussy baby. My daughter's in the kitchen trying to find the sink. David's at work. And he looks at me and goes, how can you be at peace? You look so content just sitting there. And he watched me put Danny Lynn to sleep. And we had a discussion about this that Through all things, my God can keep me at peace. And if that peace abounds in me, I can share it with others. And I can put this fussy baby to sleep. And my daughter can find the sink. And it's still all good. And it's that peace that we can share that lets us understand that there really is peace in us when we can see that in other people after we share it. Okay, so the question still remains. What is it about God that Paul finds contentment? What is it about God that makes Paul able to be content in all situations? Brother uh, Brother Humphrey. For many, many years of my life, I used to say that uh, um, my pursuit wasn't happiness, it was contentment. Because in tent, at contentment, I wasn't being swayed by uh, highs and lows that were going on in my life. And um, when God comes into your life, he find, you find that even keel. You're not... Um, um, when you put your trust into God, it, it kind of evens you out. It, it kills you out because you know that He is in control. You're no longer trying to pursue happiness or stay away from sadness or whatever the case may be. The peace of God passes all understanding, bringing, bringing you to contentment. So I heard some good things. Peace, control, These are the things that God has. And when our confidence is in Him, when we know that He is in control of it all, then we can have contentment, whether we're low or high. Brother Delph, I think I saw your hand too. Yeah, I think this may encompass everything that's already been said, but I think Paul looked into God and saw dependability that he had showed himself to be dependable throughout Paul's walk with God. And I think that encompasses everything that we've talked about. The, de- the dependability, his, you said his experience caused him to be depend- or know that God was dependable? 
Yeah, amen. So we have, we have the, the, the peace in chaos, right? Sister Defoe was describing that chaos of the newborn baby. There, and in that, there was still peace. Without anything being, having to be said, there was understanding that God's in control and also peace. And that experience brings our ability to know that God's dependable. Amen. And I think that kind of speaks to what Brother Josh and a couple others said, is reminding ourselves of when God has been there for us on other occasions. Amen. Brother Wally, I believe you had... Yeah, when Paul, when Paul was saying uh, you know, to, to God about how he would like his blindness taken away, and, and I don't know, I think it was something with his hip too or something. I don't, was, was there something wrong with his hip too? Uh, not, but then, I'm not sure. Oh, that was. Um, but anyway, oh, eyesight, he yeah. wanted he wanted his eyesight back, and just God said that well, my 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 grace is sufficient enough. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people that believe it was an, an eyesight issue. There's some debate on it, but but yeah, that's a common a belief. Yeah, that's my grace is sufficient for for you. Amen. Be, and we're actually going to go there too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, how does Christ strengthen Paul? He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me, let me pose a, maybe a better question. How does Christ strengthen you? Brother Josh. Motivation. Um, I had a friend of mine tell me not too long ago that uh, she just gave me complete brutal honesty that the reason why um, I was fa- that uh, that I was facing a, a huge lack of motivation, and you know I'd go for about a uh, solid 20 minutes about what's going on and how I'm getting discouraged. She goes, well, was, she, it was simple. She goes, well, when was the last time you prayed about it? <laughs> Ouch. And and you know brutal honesty. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Right. As long as it's done in a safe, healthy environment, was, there's nothing wrong with it. And it was that encouragement where I just, you know, took some time. I was like, you know what? You're completely right. So I took some time the same day to just pray till I get that breakthrough. And I got that encouragement that I needed. Amen. Sister Kessinger would, wanted, had something she wanted to share, too. Um, I think God strengthens us and probably strengthened Paul through that fact that you have a relationship with him. You know, you, you've you asked, he's been there. When you thought you couldn't get through and you got through it, you realize, hey, I didn't do that on my own. God opened those doors. He made that way. So having that relationship, it's just like in any relationship, in a marriage. I know I don't have to do it alone. He's right there by my side. Or when I think... It, there's no way it can't be done. And then you turn around and it's like, oh, well, my list, my list has been completed. You realize that you can put faith and you, gather, you get strength from having that relationship with God. Amen. Amen. I like that. Yeah. Go ahead. I think he proves himself. He shows that in no matter what we do, what circumstances we're facing, trial, turbulations, the joys, mm-hmm. it's through him. Nothing else can do it. When you look at what Paul lived through, what God delivered him from, nothing else could deliver him. Right. Only God could. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I, I, there's a, I, see, I see your hands, and I... I um, let's, uh, but before we quite go there, I, I like what you said about that, that he proves himself because, you know, God doesn't expect us to go from zero faith to, you know, the, the great faith of, of uh, Moses to part the Red Sea. He, he gives us step by step. He, he takes the faith like the grain of a mustard seed, a little tiny bit of faith, and he'll show up. And that builds our faith for the next time. He, he proves himself. And he will take us from zero faith to 
the great faith of someone like Moses, but it, he doesn't expect us to just have it overnight. He expects us to have some faith in him, and then he will respond to that, and that builds us up to the next. Amen. Sister uh, Watson. Um, it goes right along with what was just said, but as I was looking at the verse there, what stood out to me is twice he said, I have learned. I have learned and in both instances. And um, so I was thinking that not only in my own life, but in Paul's life, that learning came through the experiences that he faced and he found God as was spoken to be faithful. And, um, you know, and also probably from reading about the you know, previous in uh, patriarchs in the Bible, and God proved his faithfulness through that. So I think it's through our experiences, through the sharing of experiences of other people, um, we have learned, <laughs> and he's proven himself faithful. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sister Boyd. I think brother and sister Kessinger kind of hit the nail on the head is if Jesus is our center, if he is the core of who we are and we've put our faith and our trust on him as our rock, then it doesn't really matter what storm comes our way. We can be still, we can have peace in the face of that. If instead we place who we are and our self-esteem, our self-worth in something else, for example, if I place my worth in being a wife and then my husband leaves me, my core is shaken. If I place my worth in being a mother and I lose a child or they go awry in the world, I lose my faith and, and have no self-esteem. If you place your faith and your self-worth in your job and then you get fired, you're shaken to the core. But if your faith and your core, your self-esteem is all based in Christ, it doesn't matter what else comes your way. You're going to hurt, yes. You're going to mourn, but you're not going to be shaken and have a complete loss of identity in yourself. Yeah, I think that's good, particularly when you're talking about losing, losing identity. Because sometimes we do gain our identity from things you know, like, like you mentioned, I don't, I don't want to rehash that, but I, I think that's good. Our identity needs to come from the rock that, uh, that is a firm foundation. Amen. Amen. I believe, Sister Chamberlain, did you have your hand up? Well, I, I was wondering, what not it just trust that God is in control? Just trust... Said so that that we tr that he trusted that God was in control. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're talking about what what was it about God that Paul was able to abandon? Because he trusted that God was in control. Yeah, I like that. You know, there's this little story I want to share um, that kind of deals with this a little bit. Um, the story go it, this person shared. Uh, my wife's father is a Kansas farmer. And he's spent a lifetime raising wheat, corn, milo, wheat, uh, beef, and um, along the way, some sheep and chickens. And one morning while I was following him around the farm, we talked about the differences between city living and rural lifestyle. And this is what was said. Most city folks I know expect each year to be better than the last, he said. They think it's normal to get an annual raise, to earn more this year than you did last year. As a farmer... I have good years and bad years. It all depends on rain at the right time, dry days for harvest, and no damaging storms. Some years we have more, some years we have less. It was one of those indelible moments of stunning clarity that the law of the harvest, uh, some years being fat and others being lean, applies to much more than agriculture. Growing in spiritual maturity requires gratefully accepting the seasons of more and the seasons of less, that God weaves into specific areas of our lives, our friendships, marriage, career, finances, ministry, spiritual growth. Amen. I thought that was really good, 
You know, sister, you honed in on his trust that God is in control. I think Brother Humphrey also mentioned that, that control, that God's in control. But you know, this story kind of illustrates something that is, is a common thing, right? We all believe it's always going to be better. And when it's not always better, we're so dis- disappointed and so shattered, and because our confidence is in that better... <laughs> Uh, hopefully not your purchasing patterns. <laughs> Remember, we're, as Christians, we need to be good stewards and live within our means. <laughs> but we always think that it's supposed to be the best. We always think that it's supposed to be the greatest. And when that doesn't materialize, we're so devastated, we ask things like, God, what's wrong? <laughs> When our identity is found in our job and then we lose our job, where's our identity? Right? A lot of people, a few years ago, they, uh, they, they is, anybody ever gone to a financial advisor? So, uh, of any kind. It could be just, you know, something very basic, right? Good, quite a few people. So you know what, what I'm talking about when, when you say this. When you, immediately the first time you meet them, and they start to explain the stock market to you, right? And this is what they say. They show you the little graph, and they say, this is what it does, right? And they kind of gloss over those spikes that are high, and especially those ones that are low, and they show you the trend. Look at the trend. It's always going up. The long-term trend, it's an increase of 12.5% over the last 50 years. I haven't even lived that long. <laughs> right? They stretch it out. They want to show you that. Now, look, I, I, I'm, believe, I'm a believer in investing and all this kind of stuff. But, right? A lot of, some, some, of, some of you might have experienced that downward trend a couple of years ago where people lost 20% of their portfolio or whatever it was. It was a huge amount. Where so many people had to put off retirement for a few years or wondered if they were ever going to because, uh, because there was that downward, right? And immediately that, that downward goes and everybody's freaking out. What's going on? What's wrong? The economy's... Right? Because we just expect that everything's always supposed to be good. And if it's always supposed to be good, if God's blessings are showering because you see that false, that false prosperity doctrine that some are peddling in Christian circles has sometimes drifted, even though we say we don't believe it, we still kind of have a little bit of a, a creep in our belief. It's always supposed to be good. It's always supposed to be the best. It's always supposed to live in blessing. But you know what the reality is, is that sometimes there's a down. Amen. But if our confidence is in God, and we know that He's in control, that we can live for Him with strength and victory and peace, (laughs) no matter what. When we abound and when we abase. Now we've talked a lot about having confidence in God when we are abased, but it's also true that you know some people don't how to know how to act when they're full of blessing. Amen. Amen. And so we if our but if our confidence is in God, then we will have peace and we won't we won't Uh, have so much confidence in that great blessing, we will just appreciate it and know how to manage it appropriately as good stewards. Because the reality is, is that we will be, we will abound and we will experience abasement. We will experience both in our life. Amen. But our confidence is always in God. Another scripture that was shared um, is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
I want to read that again with a little bit of emphasis on, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. Three times he says, you. You shall receive power. You shall be witnesses. The Holy Spirit's coming on you. That's one of the things that was emphasized on Sunday, was that uh, having that confidence and that belief that not only does God strengthen me, but He empowers me. Maybe we should read it, and I, I know we don't want to uh, take away or add to the Scripture, but perhaps we should uh, look at it this way uh, and realize that it's being told to us and say, but I shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon me, and I will be witnesses, a witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other ends, to the end of the ends of the earth. Right. Amen. Uh, His Spirit is in you. Paul said... I, 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 I am acknowledging that there are good things placed in you in Christ or with, through Christ, right? Christ is putting things in us and one of the things that He puts in us is His Spirit. And that Spirit is an empowerment. Now, we clearly know that this Scripture means that the Holy Ghost will empower us uh, to be witnesses um, of God in this world. Uh, if you've been around this church any, any length of time, you, you know. That's what that means, right? The Holy Ghost is coming. That's what Jesus is uh, predicting. But what else, and I'm posing this as a question, what else do we receive in our life when we are filled with the Holy Ghost? We get His Spirit. What comes with His Spirit? I'll, I'll, I'll start it off with one, one thing that we know we get is joy. Because when the... <laughs> did I take yours? Uh, right? Anytime you see somebody filled with the Holy, Holy Ghost, what's happening? I mean, after the shock is uh, gone, if it's the first time, there's big smiles, there's joy, right? there's sometimes jumping, there's shouting, there's excitement. Right? Did I take yours, Brother Boyd? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Brother Paul. Boldness. Boldness. That's good. I saw Brother uh, Delph had his hand up. Refreshing. A refreshing. Amen. Anybody else? These are all good. Sister Lori? I say you get wisdom. You might not get it immediately, but over your walk with God, you get a lot of wisdom. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit. You want me to read that? Yeah, I do. Okay. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Now let me ask you a question that's maybe a little more personal. How did your life change when you received the Holy Spirit? Brother Kessinger. For me, uh, when I received the Holy Ghost, I immediately felt joy and then an overwhelming sorrow. And God immediately told me, now you experience what I experience. So now I experience what God experiences. I get to walk hand in hand and see what he sees through spiritual eyes instead of through worldly eyes. Amen. Amen. We get to experience. I like that. We, we do. There's, I've had those experiences like that where you're just like, there's an understanding comes over you. Um, 
maybe I've had that when I've prayed with people. So that's, that's good. Amen. Anybody else? Brother Boyd. Well, when I got the Holy Ghost, I, I was a teenager, and a lot of things changed. Uh, school got better. <laughs> Just being in school was better. Ooh, come and, pray for my kids. <laughs> <laughs> and it became a, a lifestyle. Living for God was a lifestyle, not just a thought. That's good. Amen. Sister Defoe, I think I saw your hand. We mentioned the word understanding, and my husband and I came to the church very late in life. Uh, We had both had faith. We knew of God, but we didn't have a relationship with him. But once that Holy Ghost came, the understanding of his word, the insight that the Spirit provided in reading words on a page, they weren't, it wasn't just a printed page anymore to me. It, it opened up that understanding of this is his Spirit in word. This is his communication to my heart. That's good. Amen. Amen. Jesus specifically tells us, promises that. Amen. Brother Delph. Yeah, it was, uh, like for me, it was like a reward. You know, uh, I came late in life, and uh, I felt the power and felt the touch when I walked into church, so I knew I was in the right place. But it took a while for me to uh, stand up and walk down the aisle with tears rolling down my face and fall at that altar. You know, but I didn't receive the Holy Ghost then. But I knew it was there, and I felt uh, close numerous times. But I drove truck, so I was on the road, you know. And one of the things I had the pastor do is give me a, uh, what do you call them, a directory of all the Pentecostal churches in America. And I'd, I've gone to more churches than I can shake a stick at, storefront churches, churches in old theaters, parking lots. And I just looked the pastor up and looked the church up in the nearest town I was going to be in. And in six months on the road, I missed three Sundays. Hmm. You know, and I kept praying for the Holy Ghost. Hadn't come yet. You know, but I was uh, still smoking. I'd stopped the drinking and stopped the cursing and all that stuff and changed the way my mind thought and all that. He delivered me from that. But that Holy Ghost, that spirit, was just at my fingertips. You know, I, and wherever, everywhere I went, I kept. You know, I'd ask him to pray for me about that and the smoking. Because that was the hardest thing I ever did. The hardest thing the Lord had me do. But I finally, I got the Holy Ghost while I was still smoking. But it was very shortly thereafter that he didn't let me keep it. But uh, it felt like I was being rewarded when I finally broke through the Holy Spirit. Took over my tongue and mine. And I just couldn't praise him and tell him how much I loved him in English. You know, I I felt like a reward to me. Because it, I, I've received what I had been diligently seeking. Amen. It's a gift. <laughs> Amen. It's a gift. Praise the Lord. Uh, Sister Boyd, I think I saw your hand. The entire trajectory of my life changed when I got the Holy Ghost. Um, I, had a, I was raised in a very dysfunctional family, and it was directionless. Um, and it was going nowhere. There was no hope in my life. Um, I wanted to go to college and make something out of myself, but my parents had told me that there was no way that would happen. Um, it, they're just all, all my friends from that period have had miserable lives. My brother also passed away early because of the choices in his life, and that's the trajectory I was on. And when I got the Holy Ghost, everything completely turned around. Thank God. Thank God. Brother Humphrey. When I first received the Holy Ghost, um, like most, I I, uh, experienced extreme joy and uh, love. But the realization came the next day when I needed to go out into the world again. And then I felt the comfort and the peace. Amen. Brother uh, Paul. 
you have to realize that I was raised in a non-Christian home, like some of the others. And uh, when, I, when I really made a decision to serve God, it wasn't like I got the Holy Ghost overnight. It was, it was months. It wasn't years, but it was months. But uh, my family thought it was going to be another one of those things like square dancing and CB, and it was just a phase I was going through. What they didn't realize, as others have said, is it was a lifestyle change. This lasted for a long, long time now. We're talking over 35 years. That God is, it was a lifestyle change that I, I have no regrets over. Amen. You know, I'm not turning back. Amen. I'm not turning back. God, God changed what I, what I was and where I was going to something new and refreshing. And sometimes when, like Brother Josh said, sometimes I need to look back and see where I came, what I came out of to remind myself where I'm going to. And, and it's all about, it's all about, it was a lifestyle change that they thought was going to be another fad, and it's, it has, it's lasted for over 30 years. <laughs> it's a long fad. Yeah. Amen. Sister Lucy, did you have your hand up too? When I got the Holy Ghost the first time, I was just a little girl, and um, I don't remember that much about it, but I do remember when I prayed back through again as an adult, pastor came into my house and was having Bible study, and um, I looked at him. I knew what the church was about, sort of, and I looked at him. I said, I don't care what you say. I'm not going to put on a dress. I hate dresses. And uh, he laid hands on me and started praying for me, and all of a sudden, the glory of God hit me. All I could see was white, and it was so wonderful. There's no way, no way. I've been high on drugs. I've drank and all that. I never have felt such a wonderful feeling as I felt in God. And I said, Lord, whatever this is, I don't want to come back. It is so wonderful. And, of course, he said, not now. And I came back, and uh, I went and bought me a dress. <laughs> Praise God. And I felt the more I gave to God, the more he's ten times back what he's given to me. Praise the Lord. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, uh, Brother Wally mentioned it earlier. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, my, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The power of Christ in him. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And uh, it was already mentioned that the, the, the context of this, Paul had a, an, an infirmity. He had a, 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 a thorn in the flesh, as he calls it, uh, this, this problem that he asked God many times said he asked him three times to take it away from me. Take this off of me. I think we can all identify that with that. We've all been at that place in, at some point in our life where we're asking, God, I, take this away from me. I, don't, I can't deal with this. I, I, don't, I shouldn't have to deal with this. Why am I burdened with this? And he's asking that. And God's response is this. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Amen. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul, because my strength is made perfect in weakness. And he, so I ask the question to you today, what does, what does that mean, my strength is made perfect in weakness? Brother Paul. I can tell you from experience that some of the most powerful services that I've been in and been a part of happened when I was sick, not feeling good, wanted to stay home, and I came, and God blessed me for it. When I was at my weakest, God, God always knew what I needed, needed what the church needed, and God has always came through. Amen. Amen. My strength, brother. When I'm weak, I can't fight things. I can't resist. I'm vulnerable. 
So that's when God can really move. That's when he can really show himself and show his might, his power. That there's none that suppresses surpasses it. Mm -hmm. um, testimony to that. January 28th, 1984. I'm sitting in a single person drunk cell in a county jail. If you don't know what that is, that's a cell that's four by four with a hole in the floor, and that's it. The jail chaplain walks in in his suit, sits down next to me, and starts praying for me. I looked at him. I was like, why a man of God in your suit is sitting on this floor with me? He's like, I can't answer that. He's like, oh, I know. As I was praying and God told me I need to come find you and pray for you. You know. <laughs> yeah. That changed my life. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. You know, we we talked a little bit earlier about how <clears throat> when we how Christ is in us. And he, God really does want to use us and having confidence in that. In that. Um, but what we're talking about here is that, is that our, our, we, 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 we can't take our personality and our giftedness out of the way because God wants to use that. But we do have to get to a point where our will really is out of the way. Amen. 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 And for you, it was that four by four cell where it's like, okay, I really can't do this. <laughs> I really, and God actually does care about me that he told this man to come pray for me. Good grief. Amen. Because we have to get our will. And for some of us, it's some of us are, some of us, we perhaps. We're willing participants, and some of us had to have a lot of hard knock life to get us to that point. But it really does come to that point where we say, "My, not my will, Lord, anymore, but yours." Amen. <laughs> you guys keep uh, biting onto my scriptures here. <laughs> Brother Wally did it earlier. Now you're doing it, John. John chapter 3, verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless he is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Amen. Because our will has to get out of the way so that... And, and, and John was talking, you know, physically, it's my time to exit, it's his time to shine. Amen. But we can definitely take that to us. It's, okay, my will, it's time to exit. Let his will be done. Amen. Let his will be done. And it's in that place of surrender where we receive the Holy Ghost, where we receive the empowerment, and then God builds our confidence, not necessarily in us, but in Him through us. And both of those grow. Our confidence to be able to be used of God, to be effective, to, so that the doubts go away, God takes us step by step. Amen through relationship, through experience, through proving Himself, through our confidence in Him, God takes us step by step to that place. Amen. And if we will allow Him, if we will allow Him to lead, if we will allow Him to uh, increase and we decrease, Amen, we will, be, we will be able to stay full of faith and trust that Christ is in us to empower us to good things. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me?
I know that we uh, we responded well, you know, to this uh, s- s- same message on Sunday that Christ is in us, Amen. But I'd like us to pray right now where we're at um, again, and just reiterate that. Reiterate that in your heart today. Reiterate that in your mind. You know what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. His grace really is sufficient for me. Lord, God really does want to empower me. He really does want to use me. He really does use me. If I'll allow Him to. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. We love You, God. We worship Your name. Lord, we praise You, God. I pray that we would walk in the confidence of Your Spirit, Lord Jesus, not in the confidence of our flesh, but in confidence in You, Lord, knowing that You will use us. You will use even me. God, we just put our trust in You. And I pray for everyone in this place, God, that as we leave today, they would go with the confidence of Your Spirit, knowing that You want to use each one of them. Lord God, You have a special task and a a purpose, Lord Jesus, for all of us to accomplish. God, and we trust that today. We believe that today. We give You all the glory, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's just thank the Lord one more time as we close tonight. Lord Jesus, we praise You and we love You. We worship Your name. We give You all the glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.